Wow. What can I do where I am? What can I do to make things a little bit better where I live? That's the question that Toni Morrison asked as a young editor during the middle of the civil rights movement when there was change occurring all around her. What can I do where I am? She decided to use her gifts, her passion, and her position as an editor basically to lift up the ideas and the words and the voices of people all around her to make sure that they were being seen and heard. She then became one of those voices herself, writing novels that made sure that every face was seen, that every voice was heard, that every story was told in a way that changed not just literature, but help define who we are as a people. What can I do where I am? That question and so many questions like it are at the heart of what we at the Obama Foundation seek to do. When people ask that question or a question like that, what can I do where I am? We seek to have them be inspired by that question not to look to their left or to their right or to someone else, but to look first within themselves for the voice and the power that they have, but then to begin to analyze what needs to be done in their community. That is their responsibility. We seek to empower them, whether they are in South Africa, in Southeast Asia, or right here on the south side of Chicago, not by giving them something that they don't already have, but with some tools and some support so that they can be more powerful than they even imagine. And then more importantly, once we do that, we seek to connect them. We seek to connect this network of change makers together because there is a truth that all of you are seeing here at this gathering. That even though all of us have voice and power and agency, None of us do anything alone. The things that we accomplish together are far greater than what we can do by ourselves. And so gatherings like this, you see it manifested digitally with our online tools and our storytelling tools. And then one day, one day on the south side of Chicago in Jackson Park at the Obama Presidential Center, there will be a place a place that will be a beacon for people who, when they ask that question, what can I do where I am? They know that there is a place on the south side of Chicago where hope lives. That's what we are doing. And when you draw people together and you make connections like the connections we've made, and you witness how important it is for a young person who is beginning her leadership journey to be guided and inspired by someone who's a little bit further along in their journey, you see now how where I am and what I can do becomes real for so many people. And so today, I am so proud to introduce a conversation that will let you see how we do that. I'd like you to join me and welcoming to the stage four of our Obama Foundation program participants. I'd like to welcome DeAndre Brown, Samira Kujak, Mimi Gonzalez, and Awa Francesca Mbuli. Please welcome them to the stage. And these powerful young people are going to take part in an amazing conversation with a brilliant young actor, organizer, and activist, Yara Shahidi. And ladies and gentlemen, the 44th president of the United States of America, Barack Obama. I'm What's going on up 
together. <laughs> all right, settle down, all of you. Hello, everybody. I am so honored to be here. Can we just see, how, how's everyone's day been? Good, excellent. It's been pretty incredible, and I'm, I'm really honored to be here and share space with incredible leaders in their own right um, and start a, a fascinating conversation that continues in the vein of, you know, I think everything we've heard this morning and everything we continue to hear about the importance of the individual and the importance of our communities that raise us. Um, and I, I think, should we just jump right in? Is that okay? Let's just jump in. Yeah. <laughs> Why not? Uh, well... What I loved is just the, the theme of this conference, talking about place, because I, I think for me, place is always really represented in interacting with your history and, and the legacy of where you are. Um, one of the only tattoos on my body, this is a side note, but it will make sense in a second. <laughs> um, right. Mom, it, mom's wondering where this is going right now. We actually have tattoos in the same place. She oh, knows exactly go. where this is going. Um, but it's... 1963, and it, for me, represents the work that was done that year, um, as well as the atrocities that occurred that year, from the bombing of the Birmingham church and the assassination of Medgar Evers to the March on Washington, and uh, more importantly, a larger idea of people continuing to work towards a future they weren't necessarily guaranteed but deemed essential. And I know that 63 is also a pivotal year for Chicago, um, as 200,000 students boycotted segregationist school policies. Um, and so in talking about place, one of my first questions is just, how do we as a community continue in the legacy of the work that's presented to us? Well, first of all, I, I am just thrilled with uh, this representation of amazing young leaders that uh, I've had the opportunity to get to know and to see uh, and to learn from. Uh, and be inspired by all around the world. Um, and uh, Yara, thank you for participating and helping to moderate this. Um, you know, the objective of the foundation is to create more and more platforms by which all of you can thrive and succeed. And one thing to remember about 1963 is that most of the leaders of the civil rights movement were your age. I mean, Dr. King, when he first started with the Montgomery bus boycott, was 25, 26. Think about that. Uh, John Lewis, uh, who is one of the only remaining, in, in fact, I think is the only living person on the original program that I have framed. It, uh, it was given to me as a gift from the March on Washington, was just barely 2021. 20, and so one place to start when you think about where do we go next, how do we continue um, to bring about greater equality, greater justice, greater opportunity, uh, is to remind yourselves that uh, the same doubts, uncertainties, struggles, difficulties, challenges that sometimes may weigh you down they were going through. The same divisions and arguments about how should we approach social change? Uh, who should be in charge? What are our best tactics? They were having those same discussions and arguments. Uh, and perhaps most importantly, I think it's really useful to remind ourselves that they were part of a continuum just as you are part of a continuum. So we were talking backstage about the notion of nonviolent resistance. Well, Dr. King and uh, civil rights workers had learned the idea of nonviolent resistance by watching Gandhi in India and uh, the movement to achieve independence from colonialism. 
And so they were part of that continuum. They were part of a continuum of Charles Hamilton Houston, uh, a, uh, one of the first African Americans to attend Harvard Law School, who helped to engineer the strategy with Thurgood Marshall that ultimately led to Brown versus Board of Education. That was another uh, part of the river that they were merging with. Um, Rosa Parks had learned to sit down, not just because her feet were tired, but because this, the Highlander School, which drew on some of the activist traditions dating back to the Great Depression and before, that was part of the stream. So you're part of that continuum. And the good news is that when you start feeling um, that you're part of something larger, that you're taking a baton from somebody else and then you're running your stage of the race and then you're passing it on, A, you don't feel as alone. B, it also gives you a sense of perspective and some patience. Because it is very rare where change happens overnight. And that's, now, when you're young, you're supposed to be impatient. If you're, if you're too patient and you're young, you may not get to where you want to go. But the danger of impatience is you can get discouraged if change doesn't happen right away. And, and I think that uh, the most important thing for all of you is to remember that the work you're doing in this place at this moment is not going to be the beginning and it's not the end. And as long as you are doing good work in that moment, at that time, and helping people concretely move the needle a little bit, push that boulder up the hill just a, a bit, then you can take satisfaction with that, and, and, and that's what builds over time. But, um, I don't know, that, uh, does, does that make sense? Mimi, what, what do you think about the question? How do you, how do you think about being part of, being part of as, a, a, as a really young person, and you're trying to figure out in your specific community, when you're out there bringing about change, are you thinking about the struggles of people before you, or uh, are you just thinking, man, this seems hard, and how do I get this done now, and what do you think? Well, uh, I'm not really focused on if it's hard for me, you know. Tell us a little bit about what you're doing, just so that people know. So I'm Mimi, I'm in the Hartford Community Leadership Corps. Uh, my project there, uh, we are trying to create an organization called Wealthy Minds. So don't think wealthy like money, think wealthy like wellness. So Wealthy Minds. And basically what we want to do, um, so there's a lot of resources in Hartford. But a lot of people don't know where they are, maybe they have an access issue, or they just don't know how to get to these resources. So my group and I, we want to create a platform and a space where we can connect these people in Hartford with the resources we already have. And while we do that, we also want to connect it back to the arts. Because whenever there's something going on in the community, you know, the way we express pain is through the arts. Like sometimes we want to listen to music or we want to do spoken word or we, you know, go to see a film, whatever it is, the arts provide an outlet for everybody. And that's what we want to do. So we, have a, we had our first pop-up event actually two, two weeks ago and it was amazing. We had about 50 people come out and we, ha we partnered with the Jordan Porco Foundation, Hartford Psychological Services, and the Hartford Gay and Lesbian Health Collective. And they provided resources that we could give back to the people already in our community. And we had a drag performer perform, we had a spoken word singer, and it just felt like a space of healing towards something better. Excellent, yeah. fantastic. <laughs> Do you want to uh, do you want to move on to another question? Because I've got questions for all these people. <laughs> yeah, then let. Because they're really much more interesting than me, <laughs> or at least you've heard from me more than you've heard from them. 
Okay, well then, uh, for the sake of hearing from somebody else, let's actually hear from DeAndre, who has a question about what catalyzes change. Okay. Um, so, good afternoon. Um, <laughs> I've got to be formal for the television, you know. But um, my question is, um, I know what passion and drive it takes to work hard and change something and to do something that many other people can't do. What, as a, as a black man, what make, made you believe that you can change an entire country or change things in an entire country in a place where you were, I've especially been told that I can't do it? And when did that happen? Uh, you know, I was dropped on my head as a child. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so I didn't have any sense. <laughs> uh, well, I, I think this actually uh, connects with, with Yara's earlier question about, about how do we sustain a movement. You know, there's, a, there's a corollary to that, which is how do we sustain our own sense of hope and drive and vision and motivation, um, and how do we dream big? Uh, and for me, at least, it was not a straight line. It wasn't a steady progression. Mm -hmm. It was an evolution that took place over time as I tried to align what I believed most deeply with what I saw around me and with my own actions. One of the things that I used to do trainings for community organizers, uh, and we used to uh, tell folks, if you want to know what your values are right now, look at where you're putting your time, your money, your energy. Mm -hmm. You may tell yourself that you are really community-minded, but if all your time, money, and energy is going into going to the club or uh, playing sports, then that's actually what's important to you. Now, what happens is I, you know, as a young man, I've, I've said before uh, that I was kind of a goof off. When I was your age, I was not sitting on the stage talking <laughs> in some serious voice about me. <laughs> you know, I was out there trying to get with some girl or playing basketball or, you know, doing things I shouldn't have been doing. Mm -hmm. um, but what, what started happening was that I would read, let's say, about Nelson Mandela and the struggles in South Africa. And I'm in a class, and I'm raising my hand, and I've got some opinion. Uh, or a representative of the, the African National Congress would come to campus, and they were my age, and they're risking potentially getting thrown in jail, or they're in exile, trying to struggle. And I'm saying to myself, hmm, if I really do believe in that, then what am I doing about it? Yeah. And what am I willing to give up? And what am I willing to sacrifice? And so there was this long process for me of aligning what I said I believed in with my behavior and then testing what I could change so that the world would align better with what I believed in and my values. And so, so the first stage is just kind of figuring out, all right, what do, you, what do you really believe? What's really important to you? Not what you pretend is important to you, but what is really important to you? And what are you willing to risk or sacrifice for it? The next phase is then you test that against the world, and the world kicks you in the teeth <laughs> and says, you may think that this is important, but you know what? We've got other ideas. And who are you? And you can't change nothing. And so then you get through a phase of trying to develop skills and courage and resilience and you try to fit your actions 
to the scale of whatever influence you have. So I came to Chicago and I'm working on the south side on trying to get a park cleaned up or trying to get a school improved. And sometimes I'm succeeding, a lot of times I'm failing, but over time you start getting a little bit of confidence with some small victories. And that then gives you the power to then analyze and say, huh, here's what worked, here's what didn't, here's what I need more of in order to achieve the vision or the goals that I have. Now, uh, let me try to take it to the next level, which means then some more failure, <laughs> right? And some more frustration because you're trying to expand the orbit of your impact. And I think it's that uh, iterative process, right? It's, it's, it's not you come up with a grand theory of here's how I'm going to change the world, and then suddenly it all just goes according to clockwork, at least not for me. For me, it was much more me trying to be the person I wanted to believe I was, and at each phase, challenging myself and testing myself against the world to see if, in fact, I could have an impact and make a difference. Over time, you'll surprise yourself. And it, it turns out that you can, and, and by the way, I took one particular path, but I would imagine those of you who, let's say, are teachers, the first time you go in a classroom, those kids are going to say, you clearly don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> and they'll be bored, and they'll test you, and they're, you're frustrated, and you're depressed. I know because I, my sister is a teacher. And then over time, you gain more confidence, right? It's the same thing. If, if you are running a health clinic or you are trying to engage in human rights uh, work, you know, it's this constant uh, fine-tuning of matching your values, your actions, and your impact. Uh, and that takes time, right? So, so you shouldn't expect at 18 that you got a master plan. Um, uh, Samira, uh, you, you're doing extraordinary work in some of the most difficult imaginable places with people who have been severely traumatized by a terrible conflict. Um, I'm assuming that you've had to go through this similar phase where there are a lot of times where you say to yourself, how can I have any impact in something this large? Um, maybe you can share with people what it is that uh, you're doing and, and then describe how, do, how have you thought, at, because you're, you're slightly older than uh, DeAndre, yeah. well, you look at the same age, but <laughs> you've, 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 uh, you've already been able to build up uh, yep. an organization and, and focused your work, so, so you're a, a little further down that path. Tell, tell us a little bit about what that's been like. Well, to start with, it's exactly what you were talking about, the small victories that matters. Because yes, we resist, we mobilize, and we fail. But we always find some kind of small victories that gives us hope to continue and keep on going. But we learn from our failures. And I work in the, in the field of missing persons from the Syrian conflict. And there's, as you know, I mean, conflict is all over the Middle East. And what we do is we try to, one, allow people to have voice because it's very important. It's very important in shifting narratives. And once we're able to shift narratives, we're able to mobilize more, to have solidarity with different individuals who are going through the same things. At the moment, the fight continues because there is no peace yet in Syria. But the people are empowered. The people are empowered through international advocacy, through different mechanisms available for them, and through their own voice, the stories that they write. And here comes the importance of human rights and education at the same time. Because it's not only building on now, it's building on the youth. And they are going to actually carry on and fighting this until we are able to reach somewhere beautiful.
I feel like what everyone's saying also ties into this conversation that's being had of focusing on impact over legacy. And, and part of action is living in such a consistent moment in the present that you're not necessarily thinking about what you're leaving behind, but part of appreciating the small victories is acknowledging the impact that's being made in every exchange. Yeah. Well, look, I, I, uh, you know, I used to have uh, these sessions at the end of the White House internship cycle, mm -hmm. where you'd get uh, about 200 White House interns. Typically, they had interned in various offices for about six months. And I would come in at the end of their internship with a group session, and I, they'd ask questions. And these were all, you know, high-achieving type A, you know, gotten straight A's, you know. They were, they did not act like I acted at their age. <laughs> they were, you know. Um, so in, invariably somebody would ask me, you know, Mr. President, they wouldn't be this bold, but it was basically, how, how can I be president? <laughs> it, it, you know, in the sense of they were asking, no, in a, in a, in a sincere way, they were asking, you know, I, I, I'm inspired by the idea of public service, you know, what, what path should I take? How should I think about it? And you know, the thing I used to tell them, uh, which, was, which was something uh, an older uh, friend of mine had, had told me back when I was still organizing. Uh, he, I remember him telling me, and I related to these young people, uh, worry more about what you want to do rather than what you want to be. Mm -hmm. Part of the problem of politics is typically, whether it's Washington, D.C., or any other capital around the world, a lot of people got there because they had an idea in their head of, I want to be a congressman, or I want to be a, a member of parliament, or I want to be X, Y, Z. And first of all, you're playing the lottery a little bit, because there's a limited number of those uh, seats available. But the other thing is, when that's your focus, you may spend 10 years just trying to be something. And when you get there, it turns out that you have no idea what you want to do with it. <laughs> so you have no moral compass. You have no, uh, no issue or cause that you're willing to sacrifice everything for or lose your seat for. All that's important to you is to stay that thing that you wanted to be or to be the next thing on whatever the pecking order is. Whereas if you focus on what you want to do, right? the question you're asking is, how can I get these kids who don't have advantages a great education? And I may start off teaching, or I may decide I'm going to start an after-school program, or I may decide that I'm going to mentor while I'm paying the rent doing something else. Or I may decide I'm going to hire some of these young people and train them. Or I, and organically, out of doing that thing, it may turn out that your influence expands and you get expertise in that field and suddenly you're a leader in advancing the thing that you cared about. And if you do end up being in a high office or in a head of a big organization or whatever, you, you're very clear about what you're doing about it. And by the way, if it doesn't work out perfectly, exactly the way you planned, along the way, all these people have been touched. All this good's been done. And, and, and your life is full. So, um, yeah. I, you know, chasing an office or a position 
is a little bit like just chasing money. I don't want to belittle it in the sense of like, you need money to pay the rent. Uh, you need a job. I, th that is honorable and right. But after a certain point, what the people I find who end up being most satisfied, even if they're in business, are the people who just, they, they were really passionate about this thing they wanted to do. That's what excited them. And as a byproduct of that passion, it turned out that they ended up being very successful in business. So, oh, well, tell us about how you've been thinking about your passion. Uh, and I know that uh, you were telling me backstage that some of the things you wanted to do hasn't, haven't gotten done yet. And yeah. so how do you process that and how, you, how do you deal with that and keep on going? Thank you, Excellency. And, and tell, tell everybody. <laughs> <laughs> mm, being a survivor of human trafficking and coming from a community where everyone believes that we have to make it big or large in life by traveling abroad and then trying to dissuade people from that idea it seems so difficult, but we have to break boundaries. I go about, I do my things my own way with female survivors as well because we are female led. We go to the communities, the hinterlands, we talk to people, showing them short videos, pictures of who we were during our ordeal and the present hours we have changed. That sadness is no longer there. It's very difficult to convince them. But our passion still lives. You know, your passion can be food, and if you don't eat, you will not be happy. My passion is to combat human trafficking. So if I don't go there to make a change, I feel as if something in me is lacking. So we always push forward. We push so hard that we don't even feel the pain. We just feel the joy because we are realizing what we are doing. From what we are doing, many people have learned what human trafficking is in my community because at first, as I've earlier said, they saw it as a sign of prestige in their community or a source to a greater livelihood. But our work is making changes. It is cutting across boundaries. People are reaching back to us with positive stories. We didn't end there we also start to do some empowerment training because some people will say, you don't want me to do this, you don't want me to go out, so what do I do? We try to empower the women in economic empowerment schemes, vocational training, the little we can, and they are doing well in their community. They have now realized that the resources in their community can also be put into use. So our passion is being satisfied and the changes are being made. Thank you, Thank you. Excellency. And so it feels like there's this connection of, of everyone in this room of remaining purpose-driven and being united by our drive to consistently be doing. And at the same time, we've also had this conversation on access and the importance of access and resources, as well as the importance of your personal circumstances influencing or feeling like they influence what you can or cannot do, which kind of ties into Samira's question regarding what happens when there are certain things that feel like they are impeding you from the doing itself. Mm -hmm. Samira, you had uh, you Actually, yeah, I have a question. Thank yeah. you, Yara. <laughs> um, yeah, she teed you up. <laughs> <laughs> so um, you mentioned a lot the importance of peace and peacekeepers in transforming communities. And we just spoke about the time it takes and the little victories. But sometimes there are peacemakers and peacekeepers who jeopardize their safety when they are trying to step up and fight and resist. So what can, you, what, what can we do when it comes to that? Well, you know, this, this is something that we've been uh, struggling with in the foundation. I struggled with as president. Uh, there are parts of the world in which being an activist is not just a matter of sacrificing higher pay or you know, having longer hours, or experiencing frustrations because your issue isn't advanced as quickly as you'd like. There are parts of the world where you'll be imprisoned. There are parts of the world where you may be killed. There are parts of the world where 
even if you're not killed or imprisoned, your family may be threatened or lose their jobs and their livelihoods because you've been exercising your voice. And there are some participants of this summit who are operating with extraordinary courage in those circumstances. Um, and part of what my personal advice to these advocates uh, has been is that you do what you can, uh, but this is a long path. And so if at any point the threats or uh, dangers that are presented from your work uh, get to be too great, you should not feel as if uh, you are somehow compromised if you say strategically, okay, I have to be careful about how I approach these issues. Um, I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, we used to have these young leaders forums around the world while I was still president. And you know, if we were doing it in most European countries, a lot of the young leaders were you know, overtly political. They'd be human rights activists, or they would be you know, young parliamentarians, or, and they would be challenging the status quo and protesting, and et cetera. When we went to Asia, so for example, in Vietnam, we had a young leaders corps, I think eventually had like 70,000 members online who would meet and discuss strategy, et cetera. Most of them were entrepreneurs, so they were couching their work as business in a country in which business was welcomed, entrepreneurship was welcomed, overtly political work might be endangered. And so somebody who was concerned about environmental issues there, they might have a startup designed to figure out how do we get clean energy into a community or how do we uh, recycle rather than directly say, government, you need to do X, Y, Z. And, and I think that it's, it's, it's useful to just remind ourselves that there are a bunch of different ways to have an impact. Uh, now, if what's inside of you compels you to take great risks, then that is magnificent. And I, uh, to the extent that I can, certainly when I was president, it's harder now, because I don't have some of those formal levers, want to create a, a ways of protecting. Uh, so those who do engage in that kind of activity in countries where that is dangerous, uh, my best advice is to make common cause so that you are not isolated. Right? I mean, yeah. if you are a journalist in a country that exercises severe censorship, you being a part of an international journalist organization that knows who you are and sees you so that if you are suddenly not around, are there to advocate on your behalf and can bring some international pressure to bear, that becomes important. And that's one of the reasons why, what one of the functions of, of the foundation over time, my hope is that it uh, creates sufficient connectivity between people who are working on these issues around the world and inside this country that nobody is alone. Um, when you're alone, it's tough. Uh, the, going back to the point you made about the civil rights movement, everybody, everybody was scared. You go out in the Mississippi or Alabama in 
the early 60s trying to register folks to vote. It was scary. Uh, people were killed or beaten, and which is why courage was generated from us collectively taking that leap. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what other questions we have? Because I want to make sure I don't get into trouble. <laughs> people will, I'll, I'll talk. <laughs> Uh, who hasn't had a chance to ask a question? I have not. Go ahead. Okay. My question reads, Your Excellency. You know, <laughs> Your Excellency I, makes me feel old, though. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you can call me Barack. Yeah, Barack's good. Mr. Obama, I guess, if you have to. Okay. And I'm coming from Cameroon, and we have an ongoing crisis there. Um, not political, but my question returns, how can we create economically viable communities for the people who serve in places where conflict threatens progress? Well, that's a big question. <laughs> yeah. um, so maybe I'll broaden it a little bit. To, uh, you know, one of the biggest challenges that all of us face in wanting to create a, a more just society is there is some bedrock material necessities that people need to thrive. Uh, it's not as much as those of us in wealthy countries think, but you do need food, shelter, uh, health care, clean water, there, there, are, there are some basics. And uh, you know, one of the things, even on the south side of Chicago, that used to be a challenge, there, there was a saying in, in the black church that uh, you know, it, it's hard to preach to an empty stomach. And so uh, advocates on behalf of social justice cannot ignore economic justice. And it is important for us to constantly incorporate at least an awareness of what may be the economic impediments to justice. So if you are advocating on behalf, that, that's why the story you were telling was so powerful about young women being vulnerable to trafficking in yeah. part because they're trying to figure out how do I get a life? How do I live? And if, if somebody comes to me and says, oh, if you go overseas, that's the land of milk and honey, yes. and you've got nothing, you're more vulnerable. Yes. Well, there are versions of that everywhere. The young men who are in the drug trade, just down a few blocks from here, it's big because they are in a community in which the fabric of regular work has been broken. And this is the economic framework that they see. And, and so we, we cannot ignore the, the economic elements. Now, the strategies for economic development in rural Cameroon are gonna be different than the strategies on the south side of Chicago, there is a basic prerequisite for economic development, and that is you can't have people killing each other. Uh, you know, Syria's economy is not going to recover anytime soon. You know, uh, th th those countries around the world that are in the middle of ethnic conflict, yeah. their economies suffer because. You know, I, I always tell, I was talking to uh, Bill Gates about some of the work that, uh, terrific work that his foundation does in terms of uh, vaccinations and uh, other organizations that do work developing these great seeds that can increase agricultural yields. But if all the farmers have fled <laughs> because a bunch of kids have AK-47s and are shooting and robbing people, it, you won't get economic development. So, so there, there is a basic just 
people not dying <laughs> or at war in order to build some sort of economic development strategies. Uh, I can speak here to, the, and this, by the way, is why place is so important. Let's just take the example of the south side of Chicago. Chicago is a wealthy city in the wealthiest country on earth. But there is a segment of this city that does not partake of that wealth the way it should. Part of the reason Michelle and I decided to locate the presidential center here is so that it can serve as a catalyst to stitch together the economies of downtown Chicago and north side Chicago with south side Chicago and eventually west side Chicago. Um, and by, by bringing a you know, multi-million dollar project here, one of our goals is to make sure that we're able to create new opportunities for the young people who live here. Uh, in one of, the, uh, one of the sessions, Charles Barkley was talking about how he gets frustrated that uh, not enough young men in the African-American community go into the trades, being a plumber, electrician. Well, part of the reason they, historically, is they were discriminated and, and blocked from joining unions to be part of those trades. But part of it is also culturally, we somehow think, well, that's not like a cool career. It's very cool to be a carpenter, a plumber, an electrician, and you make a really good living. So when we started putting out bids for who potentially could do the work, we said, if you don't have a plan to get young people in this community on the path of training for these trades, so that at the end of what will be a four-year project, we don't have just a building, but we suddenly have a whole bunch of young people who suddenly now are able to work on the next building and the next project. Well, then uh, you probably won't be working for us. You know, we've got small businesses. We've got small business districts in the surrounding community around the site where the library will be located. Some of them are struggling. We anticipate 700, 800,000 people may come to visit the library and the presidential center. Well, before it's built, we need to be working with that small local restaurant or that you know, local print shop or what have you to say, all right, they're coming. What do you need in order to take advantage of this stream of, uh, of customers that are going to be coming. So, so that's an example of being strategic. Our goal is to transform the world and the country and the south side of Chicago. But in this place right now, I've got this building that's going to be built. And that is an engine, a mechanism for economic development. In rural Cameroon, it might be different. It might be the thing that is really going to make a difference is if we can provide some small loans to local farmers so they get a small surplus that allows them to buy a tractor that they can share among five farmers, which in turn increases their yield. And maybe after several seasons, they can now do their own processing of that sorghum or maize, and rather than have their profits taken away by the guy who owns the, the processing plant, they can do their own processing plant on site, sell it directly to a store, and now they start hiring a few more people, and now you start creating uh, jobs, right? It, each place is going to have a different strategy. Um, now, I have to say, this is, this is not an easy thing to do because we now have global capital that can move around the planet in a second. And the people who've got a lot of money want more money. 
And it's easier for them a lot of times to say, well, I'm just going to invest in some luxury stuff downtown. Or I'm going to invest in the rich countries and come up with an app where a bunch of kids will waste their money <laughs> on a game rather than invest in farmers in Cameroon or a restaurant on the south side. Right? So there's a bunch of decision making that is, is global, and you're trying to get some of that, those resources local. Uh, and that's where organizing and being strategic about how we do that is really important. Uh, and that's why it's important for social ad uh, justice advocates to connect with local businesses and to connect with uh, nonprofits and connect with other institutions. And the, if there's a university somewhere or there's a school somewhere, how do we figure out whatever resources we have in this place, how do we maximize that in order to uh, get some leverage? And that's a, that's a hard thing to do, but nobody said ever, this was going to be easy to do. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's... If, if you're looking for easy, you're at the wrong summit. <laughs> uh, but your, your comments remind me of something that an activist named Future had said to me, and they had basically said the importance of advocating for somebody or some people other than yourself is that if you only advocate for yourself, all you're asking are for colonial infrastructures to work in your favor. All you're asking for is a shift of privilege rather than this conversation of placing yourself as a part of a global community, placing yourself as somebody who is responsible to people that they may not have interacted with because that's a process of deprivilegizing space in the first place, to right. make up a word. <laughs> that's a pretty good word. But, but I, no, look, you're, you're making a really important point. And, and this is something that all of us have to struggle with. I have to struggle with. DeAndre, you're going to have to struggle with. You, you are... <laughs> No, you are talented, obviously. And there are going to be opportunities for you within the existing structure to do well by the standards that we, that are sold to us about what it means to be successful. And I think each of us have to make constant decisions about uh, how we balance the need to pay the rent and, you know, we want our moms to kind of feel proud of us and know what the heck we're doing. I, I, I remember when I told my mother and my grandmother, grandfather, I was, I was moving to Chicago to be a community organizer. They're all like, huh? <laughs> what? Yeah. And then I explained to them, yeah, no, I'm getting paid $13,000 a year. Even back in 1985, that was broke. I mean, even back then, even with adjusting for inflation, like I was eating tuna every night. I did not have an actual bed because the place was too small, so I had this little futon mattress that I rolled. Couldn't afford the futon, just had the, the ton. <laughs> I, 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 I rolled that thing up, put it in the closet, rolled it back out. I was alone most of that year. <laughs> Waiting for Michelle. <laughs> so, uh, Where was I? I got distracted. <laughs> it was so cold that year. <laughs> but uh, oh, man, funny. <laughs> all my friends, you know, because I'd, I'd gone to a fancy school, and uh, you know, so all, all my classmates, they were all signed up for, you know, law school or business school and, you know, there, there was a track that was set up. Right. And um, I had the privilege because I wasn't, you know, my, my family was not wealthy. They were work, you know, lower middle class. But we had enough. 
so I knew, and I had a good enough education. I, I said, all right, if I ever need to get a job to just to make money, I can, so I can take some risks. Yeah. Some people don't have that luxury. Um, but, but to Yara's point, each of us have to constantly remind ourselves we're born into a society. We can't completely remake society in a minute. So we have to make some accommodations to the existing structures. You, know, you are working as an actress as well as a student. You know, you, uh, Samira, you know, even as you're doing your advocacy, you have to fund it, which means that you have to talk to some people who have money. And some of them may have money from places that you know, if you looked at it, you might say, eh, I'm not crazy about you know, what you do, but <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you, you know, we're, we're all kind of uh, adjusting to hear the structures that are presented. Okay. Uh, but this is, goes back to the point I was making earlier about just constantly testing ourselves about, does this feel like the accommodation I'm making to this existing structure, am I contributing more or less to the things I want to change? Uh, you know, am I part of the solution or am I part of the problem? And you're never going to, you know, this, this idea of purity and you're never compromised and you're always politically woke and all that stuff, I, you should get over that quickly. <laughs> the, world, the world is messy. There are ambiguities. Yep. People who do really good stuff, have flaws. Right. People who you are fighting may love their kids. And, you know, share certain things with you. And, and, and I think that one danger I see among young people, particularly on college camps, is Malia and I talk about this. Yara goes to school with my daughter. Um, but I do get a sense sometimes now among certain young people, and this is accelerated by social media, there is this sense sometimes of the way of me making change is to be as judgmental as possible about other people. And that's enough. Like if I tweet or hashtag about how you didn't do something right or used the word wrong verb or then I can sit back and feel pretty good about myself because, man, you see how woke I was? I called you out. <laughs> Let me get on TV, <laughs> watch my show, watch Gronish. <laughs> um, you know, that's not, that's not activism. That, that's not bringing about change. You know, if, 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 if all you're doing is casting stones, uh, you know, you're, you're probably not going to get that far. That's easy to do. I think speaking about the importance of media and social media being like a cornerstone of that, there's also this large move of the importance of narrative, which actually ties into what Mimi had uh, wanted to ask. I, she could be yeah, like I, a host. Yeah. Oh, this is, a, this is really an Oprah-level segue. It was really good. Do you see how really she's good. working it? Go ahead. Man. Thank you for that Very transition. <laughs> Hello. So given our theme for this year's summit and how place reveals our purpose, the arts and film in particular can influence our purpose as a nation. So what is a film that has greatly impacted you and can you provide advice to young leaders and filmmakers like me on how to leverage their craft to help shape our future? Wow. Well, we were talking about this a little bit backstage. The, the, there's a reason why we want to incorporate the arts into the Presidential Center. Right. Um, you know, uh, uh, one of our goals is to create a recording studio where young people can come and train with Yara or wow. Steven Spielberg, or Chance the Rapper, about how do they use the arts and to tell a story and to build communities, um, and, and be able to have concerts, and readings, and theater. Be because most social change starts with a story. 
we go back to 1963 or even further, the reason the civil rights movement got all that it accomplished was not because John Lewis and SNCC workers had an army behind them. At first, they didn't even have the laws behind them. But they did have a story behind them. Okay? A story about do unto others. And a story about we're all God's children. And a story about you know, justice rolling down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. There was a story that they tapped into and it proved to be more powerful than armies and billy clubs and dogs. Just as I mentioned Gandhi earlier, he had a story about what the Indian subcontinent was and this 5,000 year culture and that in the people who appeared to be poor were full of a life force that could not be matched by the great British Empire. Right? Stories start things off. The Berlin Wall comes down, no missiles are fired. The other side had a better story. So, so our goal is to make sure that the Presidential Center incorporates that understanding of, of stories. Now, to your question about what, what uh, I, I'm going to broaden it not just to films because mm -hmm. uh, I'll, I'll tell you, when I was a, a black kid growing up in Hawaii, films that influenced me were like Shaft influenced me. <laughs> da -da -da, da -da -da. <laughs> because there were not a lot of, lot of brothers around who were cool. That had, a, that had an influence. I was all like, man, look at Richard Roundtree. He's a bad. What? For those of you who are not familiar with Isaac Hayes, I just wanted to. Uh, um, you know, I, 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 probably the things that changed me the most were, were novels or. Uh, essays, right? James Baldwin's The Fire Next Time, or the autobiography of Malcolm X. Um, th there were books about the, the complexities of politics and change and, and how individuals get caught up in society. You know, books like All the King's Men by Robert Penn Warren or, or In Dubious Battle by John Steinbeck. Um, yeah, there, there were books like, like, like Song of Solomon, uh, by, by Toni Morrison that, you know, that, that changed my understanding of the, the beauty of a very specific place that people may not see or, or the beauty of lives that are forgotten. Um, or there, there were books like, you know, some of the, the most powerful things that changed me were books of people who were not like me, right? So, so I, I read uh, The Golden Notebook, by Doris Lessing. This is, it's a novel about a Brit, uh, uh, actually a, a woman of a British background in South Africa who moves to London back in the 60s and 70s. Uh, but it was one of the first, it was one of the early books to show women as not the love interest or sidekick, but as somebody who's complicated and challenging her roles and feels agency, and it helped me get out of my own, you know, stuff. Because, you know, that's the only problem with, you know, you watch Shaft and then, like, <laughs> that doesn't necessarily uh, help you with how you think about women. Right? <laughs> There's all these ambiguities that you've got to figure out. That's the thing about the arts, right? It, it, if, you, if you are reaching out and looking at a, enough different stuff, right. you know, or, you know you, you, I started reading Latin American writers, you know, like Cortaza or, 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 or 
Fuentes mm -hmm. or, or Rulfo, right? And, and suddenly you realize, oh, in Mexico or Argentina, they're going through stuff I'm going through. That's right. That's interesting. Yeah. So, so that stuff uh, is probably what changed me the most. I, I will say, but I, I mentioned Chef, but it could have been a, any, a, a whole host of things. You know, Sidney Poitier or uh, for African Americans of my generation, representation of black men in positions of authority or for black girls seeing like Diane Carroll recently died. She had a show uh, on television, first black woman who had a show where she wasn't just a maid yeah. or the help or a, the best friend of, but was actually the central figure. That stuff ends up being important. Um, and, and so when you think about the arts in whatever community, you know, thinking about how are kids imagining themselves? I was going through our house. We you know, uh, found a, a, an old book my mother used to read to me called uh, The Snowy Day. As some of you know, yeah, see, everybody yeah. wants <laughs> For those of you uh, who don't know the book, it, it's just your classic children's book. It's about a little boy. He runs out. It's winter. He wants to build a you know, snowman. He gets like this snowball, puts it in his pocket. He gets really close to it. It melts. He's a little sad about it. It's a very simple story. It's sort of a collage. My mom read it to me when I was like three or four. Uh, but it's the first children's book uh, by a major publisher. The little boy was black. Wasn't commented on. It wasn't like, oh, ghetto boy, uh, y you are in the snow. <laughs> it, you know, it, it, was, it was like, no, no, it's just a boy going on. He happened. To be black, yeah. I didn't even remember it until I looked at the book years later, and I was like, huh. That's probably important. So, uh, so, so I, I, you know, that's how art moves me. In, in fact, going to children's books, I've said this before, I, I believe this. Um, I think pretty much everything you need to know is in Dr. Seuss books. <laughs> You know, if you read about the Lorax, then you know about climate change. If you're reading about Lazy Maisie, you, you, you know, and, and Horton, you know, here's a who, you kind of know, man, don't be Lazy Maisie. It works. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, uh, Dr. Who covers, uh, Dr. Seuss covers most things. Uh, that's not the answer you expected, I'm sure. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I love The Godfather, and, you know, I can give you a list of movies I love, but. <laughs> All right, what else are we doing? How are we doing on top, yeah? I'm just a little bit. Um, but I, I, I think I want to kind of close out this session. You've already talked about the Presidential Center, and we've had a sneak peek of all of the incredible things that are here to come. But I think thinking of the larger Obama Foundation and how much you've done to not only maintain a sense of local community and continue to invest in local community, but also connect local with global, yeah. all of the global mm -hmm. initiatives that you're doing. And so... Um, as somebody that is black and Iranian, has family who is actually here from the south side of Chicago, who I think to me encapsulates what it means to be a leader and what it means to invest in community, I, I think I wonder how the Presidential Center is another form of doing that, of mm -hmm. making this a space for young leaders to connect and for us to create change. Well, I, I, I think you've described it well. Um, uh, but Michelle and I, when we decided what are we going to do next? Uh, there are a bunch of issues we care about, but, and we'll work on, but the most important thing we figured we could do is pass the baton to as many people as possible and cultivate as much talent as possible at every level. And so 
uh, all of you are part of that initial effort to build a platform where not only can we provide training and ideas uh, and offer some experience about how to bring about social change, but also how can you con connect and learn from each other, which is even more powerful? Mm -hmm. And how can you make sure you're not alone? And how can you recognize how your work connects with somebody maybe on the other side of the country or the other side of the world, or maybe just on the other side of the city? And that's how our programming is designed. What we also realize, though, and this goes to the importance of place, that for us just to have some office downtown somewhere from which we, you know, uh, issue reports and occasionally travel for photo ops wasn't going to cut it because if you are, you can't understand how to change a world if you don't understand how to change a country. You can't understand how to change a country if you don't know how to change a city. Mm. And you can't know that unless you know how to change a neighborhood. That's right. Because so much of what has become uh, our politics and our movements is virtual, which is great. It's a tool, but it's not that person right there. It's not you and me in a conversation. It's not me seeing what you're going through. It's not me experiencing what it's like with some broken glass under that little boy's feet uh, where there should be a playground or, you know, uh, stepping off in, and seeing the, the trash that's floating through a, a, a river uh, that, that has, where all the fish are dead and the, the, the fishermen's livelihoods have been taken away. You have to know that. So our thought, okay, we got to have a place. And our place had to be the place where I came of age and where Michelle was born and raised and where our babies were born and where we got married just you know, down, the, down the road and where I taught law school and Michelle was a dean and where I ran my first campaign. And so this was gonna be the place. And the way we, you know, we joke about it a little bit like this is the mothership, but <laughs> a, 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 another way of thinking about it is, is, is you know, we want this to be a university for activism and social change and a convening place for reimagining how we solve the problems that your generation will confront. And we will connect with satellites and nodes and branches all around the world, but this is gonna be the heartbeat. This will be the beacon from which we are sending out a signal that the values we believe in uh, are shared and that they're strong, and that they can overcome those who would try to undermine them, and that we can make progress. And the great thing about Chicago, and the South Side of Chicago in particular, is the same hunger for change and hope and progress that exists in communities and neighborhoods all around the world, that same hunger exists here and the same barriers that are, exist around the world. You know, people who are greedy or powerful people who are n abusing their power or n neglecting places because they're not uh, historically uh, populated with the people who people in power care about. Or, but this is a laboratory for us to be able to make those changes. Yeah. That's right. um, and, and as I indicated earlier, we can also use the center as a driver 
and an example of the kinds of changes that uh, and others were talking about in terms of creating economic opportunity and jobs. And by transforming that landscape and connecting it to other places, um, it becomes a, uh, not just we're, we're talking about change, we're, we actually have a concrete manifestation of it. So that's our goal. Um, and, and our hope is, though most importantly, that this then becomes the center around which people like Samira and DeAndre and you and Mimi and I, that because you have a thousand, a million counterparts around the world, maybe not as advanced as you are in, on their journey, but they, ha they feel what you feel. And our hope is, is that over time, what starts off with a thousand, grows to 10,000, grows to 100,000, grows to a million of young people who are connected and know each other and have a place that they can always use as home base for the work that they're doing. And if they get in trouble in their country, they've got suddenly an activist network of millions of peers who are going to say, hey, what's happening there? Mm -hmm. And if they need to help advertise an issue that's important, like human trafficking. Suddenly, Dude. we're pulling everybody together. You, that's, wow. um, that's the goal. Plus, we'll have some really good concerts here. <laughs> and some, you know, uh, some pretty fun parkland. <laughs> and uh, because I, I said earlier, you know, if you're looking for easy, you came to the wrong summit. Yeah. Some of this stuff also has to be fun. Michelle reminded me often that, uh, and she still teases me about like, oh, if it's fun or it tastes good, he doesn't want it. <laughs> um, <laughs> which, you know, is a little cruel, but there's a little bit of truth to it. There, are ti there have been times in my life where I, I just feel like I've got to take myself so seriously and grind, and, and she helped me to, uh, to lighten up a little bit. <laughs> and uh, just as she's done so much for me, so maybe that's a pretty good cue. <laughs> should, we, should we? Let's do it. Hey, Michelle Obama, how about coming up on stage? <laughs>
to the city of Chicago uh, and to the south side of Chicago, I just want to say thank you for uh, once again embracing us. Uh, our hope is that you are as excited and jazzed by this vision that we have for, uh, for the Presidential Center as, as Michelle and I uh, have been. And uh, we can't wait to continue to provide opportunities for the young people in this particular community, but also around the world to achieve their full potential and as a consequence, help uh, lift this world up. So you guys have been wonderful. Thank you so much. God bless you. Appreciate you. Great job.